Hi everyone, my name is Katherine Materna and I'd like to present about my thesis project, uh, which in a few words is attempting to understand uh, the causes of asymmetric positioning errors in GPS data. Um, when GPS data is obtained for scientific purposes, we try to, uh, try to uh, obtain position estimates as accurately as we can. And one of the steps that goes into this is estimating the delay in signals coming down from satellites due to the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, if, the, if the atmospheric delay is estimated correctly, we would expect that the remaining errors are simply due to random noise and that they show up as pretty much a Gaussian distribution. As we'll see, there are cer certain stations in the United States that do not show this error pattern, and these are the focus of my project. For a little bit of background, um, in the United States we use GPS for a lot of applications in geophysical research. There's a network of about 1,100 continuously operating stations in the United States, and the, these stations can produce position estimates with accuracies of several millimeters. Um, this data is useful for scientists who study earthquakes, volcanoes, ground deformation, and many other applications. A couple of useful definitions for this project. Um, one of them is skewness, which is a measure of the asymmetry in a distribution. For something like a Gaussian, which is symmetric, the tail on the left is equal to the tail on the right, the skewness is exactly zero. But for something with a stronger tail on one side than the other, the skewness is non-zero. If the tail is to the positive side, the skewness is positive. If the tail is negative, it's, to the neg it's negative. Um, and the other useful concept that I've introduced already is called atmospheric delay. Um, GPS signals uh, are slowed down through the Earth's atmosphere as they um, propagate down. And modeling this error is actually one of the largest sources of error in GPS position estimates. Um, one reason it's so difficult is because the atmospheric delay varies based on the weather. So it's constantly changing from place to place. It's constantly changing in time. Here's an example of a GPS station that produces position estimates over time. It's the, this is the estimates in the north, the east, and the vertical components of P549. This is a station that's in Southern California and it's been recording from about 2007 to the present day. Um, an interesting thing to note, and the, the uh, thing that you should draw your attention to, is the fact that there are many more position errors north of the station than there are south of the station. So when this particular station is having a bad day, is recording measurements that are off from the normal position, um, more often than not, they're north, and they're not south. Um, also interesting is that um, when this data is displayed as a histogram, the same, same information, um, you can see that it's actually more likely to have position errors east of the station rather than west as well. Um, this green histogram shows the east um, component and errors in the 2 to 4 millimeter range are a lot more likely than errors in the minus 2 to 4 millimeter range, which basically don't happen. As I began to study this problem in the, the network, um, one of the first things I noticed is that the direction where the outliers are more likely is not a random direction. It, uh, as we saw in, in, the, in P549 in Southern California, the, the outliers are mostly north and they're a little bit to the east. So I created a vector out of these two quantities and plotted this vector on a topographic map uh, surrounding the station P549, for example. Um, interesting thing to note that, that I noticed at this station and many of the other stations um, that show the same pattern is that the direction of the, uh, in which the outliers are likely is related to the direction where the topography is high, um, especially at a scale of several kilometers. The local scale topography doesn't really have an effect. Um, topography at huge scales doesn't really have an effect, but at the in this case, the scale of 4.5 kilometers, anywhere between 3 to 5 kilometers, usually um, shows a correlation with the direction of the skewed outliers. As another example, uh, I started to look at a region of stations in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, the Sierra Nevada are this chain of mountains here. This is California. This is the state of Nevada. And there's a, a collection of stations here, many of which often show outliers uh, that are skewed in one direction. They're preferred in one direction over the other. And also many of these outliers 
uh, are preferred in a direction that points towards the mountains. So this row of stations here, these stations, many of them more often than not are pointing towards the, the, uh, the direction where the topography is high. The next question um, that, I, that I looked at was where do these stations with high skewness occur? Are they geographically, uh, or how many of them are there and where do they occur? Um, it turns out that there aren't too many. In the station, uh, in, in the network of about 1,100, 58% uh, of the stations have a fairly small skewness value. Their data is uh, symmetric about the average position. And uh, on the opposite extreme, about 4% of stations have really, really large skewness value. And so I focused on these um, stations with the skewness value greater than one. Uh, there were 46 of them. And I, I looked at them further, some of those stations further in the rest of this project. So where do they, where do they show up? Uh, using the same type of information, the same, the same classification that I showed on the previous slide, I color coded all of the stations. Anything with a skewness between 0 and 0 0.25, I color coded blue because um, that's the lowest category. It didn't, it didn't really trigger any flags or wasn't super exciting for this project. Um, the really exciting ones were I colored red, and I looked at where they occurred in the United States. Um, if I showed the entire map of the United States, uh, we wouldn't be able to see anything interesting because the entire eastern half of the United States doesn't have any highly skewed stations. Uh, it also doesn't have very many stations. Um, <laughs> on, on the other hand, California and Nevada are, are interesting regions to look at uh, because there are Certain areas, for example, the Central Valley, which is uh, in this region, um, has stations that are fairly well behaved. They don't have skewed outliers. Whereas this region in the Eastern Sierra has a high density of skewed stations. There's also a fairly high number of skewed stations in the Los Angeles area. For uh, for the remainder of the presentation, I'm actually going to focus on two particular stations in the Sierra Nevada, the region inside of the circle on the previous graph. Um, the stations I'm looking at are P642 and P643. Um, this is the Sierra Nevadas. And for a little bit of context, um, this, is, this is Mono Lake, and this is the Owens Valley. This valley, um, the gradient between the high mountains and the low valley is really strong. It is one of the highest... Uh, contrasting areas in the United States. There's about three, this is about 4,000 meters elevation, this is about 1,000 meters elevation, and they're basically right next to each other. So it's a very steep cutoff. Um, in, in this part of the analysis, I'm, I, I looked at weather data because I was interested in not just where the outliers occur, but when they occur. Um, for example, March 13th of whatever, you know, whenever the outlier occurs, um, why is it that the, the day before March 12th, it's, it's uh, fine. March 13th, it has an outlier of 10 millimeters, and then March 14th, it comes back, appears to come back. Why does that error occur? Um, I focused on two sources of weather data to look at the conditions in the atmosphere on those days. One is a numerical weather model, um, partially because we don't really have observations of uh, weather information from remote regions like this. And the other is radiosons, which are weather balloons deployed from um, major airports. I used Oakland Airport, which is a fair bit upstream, um, but I used it as a way of looking at the weather on these particular days. These, these vectors are the output of a numerical weather model uh, at a high level of the atmosphere. And it's, it, on a particular day, it produced what it thinks the wind is doing on that day. So I studied, I studied that a little bit further. Using the output of the numerical weather model, I looked at the, the direction and the magnitude of the wind on all of the days in 2012. Um, for, first, I looked at on all days um, and, I, and plotted them in this diagram to get an idea of the general distribution of wind speed and direction in this place. This plot is called a wind rose. You can think of it as a, a histogram that's been wrapped around a circle. And when the, the uh, bars are high, it means that the probability of wind in this direction coming this way is high. 
So this shows that on normal days over the whole course of 2012, the um, wind almost always has a west to east component, which is consistent with our understanding of the, uh, the large scale flow of the atmosphere over North America. But within that range, it can, it can take almost any angle. So there's a wide range of angles that the wind can, um, can be blowing in, and also it has a wide range of speeds. The color represents the wind speed on those days. And there, there are a fair number of uh, 0 to 20 meter per second wind days. This is in contrast to a subset of days that I selected based on the behavior of station P642, um, which I, I picked the top 12, 15 days of the year when it showed really large outliers. And the distribution of wind on those days looks like this, which is a much narrower range and it's also interesting to note that the wind speed is relatively high. There are zero days here between um, zero and 20 meters per second. So that, that was an interesting observation that I kind of kept in, in uh, my mind as I was going through this project. I also used the radiosonde data to look at a similar type of question, um, but radiosondes are really awesome for giving the whole vertical profile of the atmosphere on particular days. Um, so this slightly chaotic diagram shows the wind speed on the x-axis as a function of height for every radio balloon, for every radio sun deployed in 2012. Uh, and it's color coded um, into two categories, the days that have normal measurements at P642 and the days that have outliers at P642. Uh, for a little more clarity, I used these, these populations to find the uh, mean of these uh, two categories, and it, it shows something that's consistent with the, uh, the weather model output, that basically on outlier days there's much higher wind speed than on a typical day. So at this point, I knew that the outliers often point uphill, that there's a narrow range of wind direction on outlier days, and that the wind is fairly strong. So we started to think about how coupling between the atmosphere and the local topography might be causing this issue. Uh, in particular, because we know that a lot of the stations in the Sierra Nevada are of interest for this project, um, we started to think about Lee waves, which are an interaction between a mountain and, a, uh, and the atmosphere. What are Lee waves? Um, Lee waves are simply oscillations that are excited by topography when the atmosphere is stable. Um, Lee waves can form parallel rows of clouds, as shown in this image. This is an island, and the flow of the atmosphere is directed this way, uh, and it created a pretty spectacular pattern that NASA captured in a satellite image. And the interesting, another interesting thing about Lee waves is that they've been studied for the better part of the last century, and they're described by um, some well-developed theory. Uh, they've been studied partially because they um, are interesting for airplane pilots to be aware of. their turbulence downstream of mountains and um, partially because they create really interesting meteorological phenomena and interesting clouds. In general, there are two types of Lee waves. Um, and, and the difference between these, these two types, the behavior is governed by the uh, conditions in the atmosphere on the days that the Lee waves form. There are trapped Lee waves, um, and vertically propagating Lee waves. The difference between the two is the extent that they rise in the atmosphere and the direction that their momentum is propagated. In the case of a trapped Lee wave, there's a stable, the, the atmosphere is stable, which means it can support oscillations up to a certain point, above which it's unstable and the oscillations cannot propagate above that point. Um, so in the stratosphere, you generally don't see these kinds of waves. The second type, vertically propagating Lee waves, can move all the way up into, into the stratosphere. They've been observed at 20 kilometers above the Sierra Nevada. Um, and they can actually propagate upwind of the, um, upwind of the mountain that forms them, unlike, unlike the downwind side of Lee waves. One thing that governs the behavior of Lee waves is the type of stability that exists in the atmosphere. Um, in understanding stability, there's two really important concepts. One is called potential temperature, uh, and it's, it's a concept that we can use to describe, um, it's the temperature that a parcel of air would have if we brought it down to a reference temperature, a reference pressure, usually the surface of the Earth, um, adiabatically. And we can use it to compare air at different um, 
heights in the atmosphere are taking into account the fact that air expands and cools as it rises. Um, using the concept of potential temperature, um, we can explain the behavior of Lee waves in terms of a brunt vasala frequency, as it's called, and it's the frequency at which a displaced parcel will oscillate. It's based on the gradient of potential temperature with height, and it's almost like a spring constant. So we can imagine that in, in an atmosphere that has a high brunt vasala frequency, it's like a stiff spring. Any uh, perturbation when the air is moved up over the mountain will oscillate quickly on the downwind side. Um, and if the brunt vasala frequency is low, uh, the atmosphere is less stable to oscillations and, the, and it's like having a weak spring set up on the system. I said that radiosondes are really awesome. One reason that they're really awesome is because they, they give you the pressure, the temperature, everything that you need to compute the brunt vasala frequency as a function of height. So I did that with the year with the data from the year 2012 in two separate categories. The normal days at P642, the GPS station that, that we know has some problems, and the outlier days at P642. And I found that on the normal <coughs> days there's a particular um, profile of the brunt vasala frequency, but what's really interesting is that the profile of the brunt vasala frequency is different on the outlier days. It, in particular, there is a higher brunt vasala frequency at three to five kilometers elevation on days when there are outliers. And, and you can interpret that as a higher stability. And there's a lower stability at eight to 10 kilometers elevation on the days when outliers occur. So this is interesting because it, uh, I think that it tells me when the, if there are Lee waves on these days, then they're trapped Lee waves rather than vertically propagating Lee waves. Because this is the area in which they're, um, the oscillations are supported and this is the capping layer above which the Lee waves cannot propagate. It's got lower stability. So the, the next question that I set out to answer is, uh, can Lee waves, I sort of, was sort of chasing down Lee waves, observing them, seeing if, they, um, seeing if they might be the cause of this data problem. Can they be observed on specific days? Um, and the answer is, sometimes they can. So here's the best picture of Lee waves that I found in my survey of, uh, I studied the whole year, uh, 2012, looking for Lee waves. And these are the Sierra Nevadas, this white ridge. This is on March 13th of 2012. And downwind of the Sierra Nevadas, there's maybe 10 oscillations of Lee waves that you can see from a satellite image. Um, interesting thing to note is that on this day, station P642 recorded a fairly large outlier of about 11 millimeters. So I extended this. I went looking through the whole year, trying to see if the correlation could be uh, extended. And it turns out that in the whole year, I found about 60 days that had Lee waves. Um, so about a one in six chance of seeing them on a normal day. But I picked the top 18 days of the year in terms of outliers at P642, a top 18 days of the year for 643, and found that in about two thirds of those cases, I could see Lee waves in the images. So it's, it's not perfect, but there's, there's a much higher probability that Lee waves will be observed on those days. Can I just ask, this is just on satellite imagery? Yeah, yeah, it was MODIS. No, no problem, the Brun visor, from the radio sound, the first time. We plot the Brun visor frequency also from the radio sound profile or just from satellite? Oh, the, that was from the radio sounds. The Brun Vassala frequency was from radio sounds. No, when you do the statistics, it's just from satellite? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it has some, um, it's not the most robust way of doing it, I know, because I, I'm looking at the images and I can't always tell if they're there, but I do the best discerning that I can. Um, and I'm sure there are better ways to do it, but catching Lee waves in action is notoriously difficult. <laughs> um, so could Lee waves actually influence atmospheric delay estimates for GPS and for other ranging systems? Um, there's a couple of mechanisms that have been studied before. I found two papers um, that looked at Lee waves in this context. One of them was investigating the fact that Lee waves um, are associated with vertical velocities in the atmosphere. Normally we don't have very strong vertical velocities, but during Lee wave conditions we do. And for uh, certain ranging systems, like satellite ranging systems, this might make a difference, but probably not for GPS. Another uh, mechanism that could be influencing GPS um, 
estimates is that there is water vapor that keeps changing from uh, vapor phase to condensing into a cloud and back during Lee waves, which could make a difference on the index of refraction, changing our um, estimates of atmospheric delay in a way that we're not currently uh, looking for or currently solving for. Um, and there might be other ways too. We actually don't know. So I'd like to conclude by uh, saying that the cause of the asymmetric outliers, especially in the Sierra Nevada, might be related to Lee waves based on the observations that I've found in the data. Particularly, Lee waves are much more likely on outlier days than they are on a random day. Um, and that the conditions for forming Lee waves are almost always present when outliers occur. Um, I think that the Lee waves that are causing this um, are probably trapped Lee waves rather than vertically propagating, so they're probably not in the stratosphere. Um, and, and there's still a lot of open questions. For example, on the day that I showed um, the really nice image of Lee waves, uh, P642 had an outlier of 11 millimeters, but its neighboring station, P643, had an outlier of one millimeter, which isn't an outlier at all. It's a completely normal data. So um, there's still a lot of open questions, like why are there days when outliers occur and we don't see Lee waves, and why are there days when Lee waves occur and we don't see outliers? Uh, so this is a more complicated question, but maybe in the future we can um, use this work and, and other work to um, account for Lee waves and uh, in atmospheric delay estimates and eventually improve GPS position accuracy. Thank you very much.